So, um, uh, my name is Shona McKinnon. I work at the University of Winnipeg, uh, and I actually work off campus in the North End on Selkirk Avenue uh, with a program called Urban Inner City Studies. Um, uh, UW people back there. Um, and so, I'm going to talk about a, a particular, um, we'll say, reality, challenge, or opportunity that we have in Manitoba, and I'll talk a lot about Winnipeg. Yeah. That's a great question. So for those of you who didn't hear, the question was whether or not these presentations will be available, and we are recording them, so it will all be available on YouTube. And I can also share my slides with people. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about uh, Aboriginal uh, labour market participation, and I'm particularly going to be talking about uh, those uh, Aboriginal people who um, have uh, more challenges. Um, so not all Aboriginal people have challenges. They many move through education and get jobs uh, quite easily, but we do have um, some challenges. Um, so just to provide a little bit of a context, uh, Manitoba has a large and growing Aboriginal population. I think we're all aware of that. Um, our, uh, so the Aboriginal population then is becoming an increasing source of labor. Statistics Canada, just give you an idea, estimates by 2031, about between 18 and 21 percent of Manitobans population will uh, uh, identify as Aboriginal. I think now it's probably about 16 percent or something. Harold probably knows the answer to that better than I do. Um, but it's growing quickly, it's a young population, and uh, that comes with all sorts of opportunities. Um, and also Winnipeg in particular uh, is interesting. Uh, we have the highest number of Aboriginal people in all uh, census metropolitan areas in Canada. So again, if this presents a challenge and an opportunity for us given the uh, situation that we have uh, um, in our labor market in terms of uh, 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 jobs that are available, but also the, the, the labor market shortage that people often talk about. Um, so the, the other reality that we, uh, we need to talk about is when we talk about Aboriginal people is that we continue to have this divide in our province and in our city. Um, we heard today uh, the disturbing news, uh, McLean's Magazine, uh, that Winnipeg has uh, been uh, uh, rated as the most racist city. Um, and so that's very troubling. Um, we know that increasingly people are understanding that we have a divide in our city, so I think that is encouraging. Certainly in the city election, we saw this coming up quite a bit. Um, recent polling shows that 75% of uh, Winnipeggers uh, surveyed in a poll by um, ProResearch showed that 75% uh, of the people that they talked to believe this to be a very serious issue. Um, another interesting uh, change that I would, myself have seen in the past few years is increasingly we're seeing people talk about uh, the long-term uh, effects of colonization, people understanding the intergenerational effects of residential schools and policies like the 60s scoop. And so people are now starting to realize, probably too slowly, but at least people are coming around to realize that there's a lot of work that we need to do and we've created all sorts of challenges for people that aren't easily solved. Um, the other positive uh, is that many in employers are starting to realize this. Employers are realizing that uh, there are many Aboriginal people uh, looking for work and they too want to, uh, to look at how they can improve the situation but uh, are often uh, struggling to, to, uh, to figure out how to do that. Um, a few years ago in 2012, the, uh, the Conference Board of Canada did an interesting uh, survey across Canada talking to uh, employers about, um, I guess, their experiences with Aboriginal people uh, in, their, uh, in, in the workforce. And uh, it, they clearly uh, were interested in engaging Aboriginal people in, uh, and hiring Aboriginal people, but they identified uh, a couple of essential challenges. Two of those, ch those two challenges included attracting and hiring Aboriginal people, workers, and then uh, retaining and um, uh, performance and retention. And then if you dug a little deeper in the report, uh, they talked about the multiple challenges uh, that they were finding in terms of uh, so low skills, lack of work experience, reluctance to relocate, language or cultural issues, inability to communicate, absenteeism, productivity issues, quality of work, substance abuse. And so these were the issues that they identified in their report. 
In 2013, there was a forum in Winnipeg with uh, leaders, a cross-section of leaders, and it was interesting that the business leaders at that forum identified in particular the, the need uh, to focus on uh, education uh, for Aboriginal people. And so I think this is just increasingly telling us that uh, the, the employers are realizing that we need to pay more attention uh, to make sure that we prepare Aboriginal people for uh, the workforce. So, but there are some challenges that we need to talk about in terms of how we do that. Um, now again, while the majority of people have no issues transitioning into the labor market, many do. And we have to acknowledge that, and we, also, we have to, to recognize that some of those challenges come from the workplace. And um, just as we know that racism exists in our city, in our province, that, that, that racism exists in workplaces. And for people who have in particular, not pleasant for anybody, but in particular for people who've had very weak labor market attachment, have, have, have experienced all sorts of uh, challenges with racism and, and being excluded, um, they'll just quit. They're not going to stick around and, and deal with that. And so part of the solution is dealing with the racism in the workplace. So we need to de address issues, um, the challenges that for uh, potential workers, but also challenges in the workplace. Um, so we've done, in, in my own work and in work I've done with colleagues, we've interviewed several people, both employers and, and, and uh, people, uh, job seekers, Aboriginal job seekers, and people training Aboriginal people, and they also talk about the complex challenge that many of, of their uh, trainees have. Employers are looking for people to be job ready, uh, but the reality is that it's not that simple. You can't quickly, you know, six months train somebody who's never worked has never, uh, you know, sometimes it hasn't known anyone who's worked and they will quickly move into a job. So we have to recognize uh, that challenge and, and figure out new ways of, of responding. So if we want to bridge that divide and, and more success, see more successful outcomes, we need to be thinking a little bit differently and we need to be thinking at, at both ends, not just focusing on what uh, trainees and job seekers need to do. We also need to look at the workplace. There are no quick fixes. Um, Adjustment and transition can be successful, but sometimes people need longer-term support, both employer and employee. Um, you know, we hear a lot of talk about reconciliation and healing. Uh, reconciliation requires both sides. It means means need, needs we need to do work on both with both parties. So, you know, the example is if you're going for marriage counseling to try to do some healing of a relationship, if one person goes. It's not usually going to work very well if the other one stays home and doesn't do any work. So it's the same thing. I mean, reconciliation means that we all have to to uh, to look at what we need to do differently. Um, and that is the truth of the same situation at the, in the workplace. Um, we can't expect employers to to understand all this and adapt if this is not something they're aware of. So we need to provide resources for those that are interested in going the extra mile and that are sincerely looking at uh, um, uh, engaging Aboriginal people more um, in, in, uh, in, their, uh, in, their, uh, in the workforce. So what employers and job seekers want and what they need, as they tell us, is, they, is comprehensive continuity of services um, for employee and employee. And so that means training for sure, yeah, moving job seekers to employers, providing that assistance to get the jobs, some short-term short, short, short -term transitional supports, but also long-term continued supports for as long as needed so that people successfully, successfully adapt to the workforce. It also means providing ongoing training for those people who uh, decide they might want to do something else. So it's sort of a long-term seamless um, services for both employers and, and job seekers. The current model that we operate from generally tends to be more linear than that. Now I will say that the province has been doing some more interesting things lately. They've got a couple of pilot projects where they're uh, they're looking at providing um, some you know more transitional supports. Um, so you know we have seen some movement there. But generally speaking, we still have this idea that we're going to train people, get them, and then send them off to, to work, and then our our job is done. It's up to them from there. Um, the re and that's just not the reality. So we need to be thinking differently. Um, so one of the things that people talk about a lot, and in, in certainly in the community, we do a lot of work in, in the, the research that I do is, is uh, really I engage a lot of people in the community to talk about what kinds of things they think they're, that are needed. 
And there's a lot of talk right now about the idea of, of a, a community-based labor market intermediary. And this is not a new model, it's been around, it's been done in other places, but we don't really have that in place here. Um, uh, certainly not the, the way that we would like to see it. So the idea being is that you develop a, a, a labor market intermediary which essentially develops the expertise about doing that transitional piece. So picking up where the trainers stop. Um, and so that you're taking some of that pressure off the training organizations by giving, uh, so that they will have somewhere that uh, their people can go to connect with employers. Um, providing all sorts of cultural uh, programs as well, and I'll just highlight a couple of um, uh, priority areas that we think uh, that would be useful in a labor market intermediary. Now that's not to say that you know, employers don't still work directly with training organizations and job seekers don't do that, but it's really providing that an, an area where there's a particular expert, expertise uh, to do that uh, matching and a place where employers can go as well to find uh, supports and uh, have questions answered. One of the things uh, in terms of looking at some features of a labor market intermediary, um, you know, we hear time and time again about relationships, how important relationships are. Certainly I hear this all the time in our small little program on Selkirk Avenue where we work with a lot of Indigenous uh, students. It's extremely important for people to feel comfortable with the people that they work with, especially when they've been excluded and been on the receiving end of racism. So we believe uh, strongly that a labour market intermediary should really fully integrate cultural reclamation and decolonizing approaches recognizing the critical need for reconciliation and healing, um, services for employers, certainly uh, to deal with uh, racism. Um, so there's a lot of things that we could be doing in the workplace, anti-racism training, historical awareness. Long-term supports, of course, for employers and job seekers, which is the critical feature. And uh, developing expertise and capacity to track employment outcomes. This is something that we don't do enough. Uh, training organizations just don't get, have the resources to do it. So we kind of lose track of where people end up. And a labor market intermediary could be a place where that capacity is developed and so that we get a better sense of where people are ending up. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we need to be sure that, it, that this, uh, such an entity would be um, appropriately funded. And in terms of design and delivery and governance, we believe strongly that this, this needs to be a community-based entity. So if you were to do one in Winnipeg, for example, it should not be you know, run from a government office. Um, we hear again, time, time and time again, from, from Aboriginal people who have had all sorts of challenges and have engaged you know, are, are in many government systems. They don't, they don't trust government. They feel uncomfortable going to a government office on Portage Avenue. Um, and so we need to think again differently about how we want more appropriate, appropriately, appropriately design and, and respond to uh, so that it's a more helpful model. And so we believe strongly it needs to be community-based. Needs to work in collaboration with training organizations because the purpose is to fill the gaps and not to uh, duplicate. And uh, then again, designed in, in collaboration with Aboriginal-based trainings and other stakeholders, uh, and essentially to ensure that the needs of all stakeholders are incorporated in, into the design and delivery. So that's it. I've included in my uh, some resources for people if they want, so I can certainly make this available. Thanks.